Thank you. So good afternoon. Uh, thank you for participating. So this is the otaku session. <laughs> and uh, otaku is uh, very important for a country uh, <laughs> because every time I go to the other country, uh, I mean overseas, uh, Japanese presence of Japan is kind of declining, uh, but not for otaku content. So, uh, yeah, how many of you know this character? Anya. Anya. <laughs> so, the foreign student f uh, coming from foreign country to Globus, they, they all know who Anya is. <laughs> and people in Japan maybe doesn't know who Anya is. Eh? <laughs> so, these mangas are, ha has become very popular. So later in this panel, I would ask a uh, distinguished panelist what we can do uh, using technology uh, for those uh, Japan manga and anime. But we will first starting uh, from, yes, uh, asking the panelists uh, uh, to introduce their latest uh, projects that, uh, that they are involved in. They're all specialists of the technology and entertainment. So maybe Emily, son, can you introduce your project? Hello. Hi, um, I'm Emily. My company is named Shibuya after the um, scramble <laughs> in Tokyo uh, because we're building um, a lot of different IPs, but also uh, focusing on creator tools to help people um, be more easily be able to storytell and create their own um, projects as in indie creators because traditionally in Hollywood, it's the barrier to entry is really high and you know getting funding is, is really difficult. So uh, we range anything from using leveraging the blockchain to um, you know sort of source uh, funding for your projects or um, using other technology to make the cost of making things like animation um, cheaper. And uh, we named ourselves Shibuya because, well, uh, we uh, are making an anime project right now, so we love um, Japan, but also because um, we believe in the future of, you know, like Shibuya Crossing, there's a lot of screens um, and a huge intersection with a lot of traffic of people. So um, that's why we're called Shibuya. <laughs> cool. So uh, Shibuya project using blockchain technology so, uh, how did it go uh, so far? Is it going well? Yeah, it, it's going very well. So, um, it started because, you know, I'm a creator myself, and if I were to pitch my anime project, which is uh, White Rabbit or Shiro Usagi. <laughs> Shiro Usagi. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, and if I were to try to pitch it in Hollywood, it would be very, very difficult and take a very long time. Mm -hmm. And then so... Um, leveraging blockchain and NFT technology, we were able to uh, begin creating it um, last year. And mm. within the first 20 minutes, we um, mm. sold $1.2 million worth of NFTs. And uh, now we can make this anime project <laughs> with mm. that money. Um, and it's been ongoing. So um, it's about 70% um, completed. But uh, every time we complete a section, we release it online. And then mm -hmm. so, you know, we've been gathering a fan base already. Um, and it's been interesting to see this mm -hmm. IP uh, spread mm -hmm. before the completion mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. um, animation itself. Yes. And like this year, the uh, um, IP was uh, the main character for mm -hmm. um, a Linkin Park music video mm -hmm. on YouTube. Oh. And it has I think, over 60 million views. Wow. <laughs> on YouTube now, and so you know there there's that many people who have mm. seen um, our IP, but mm. it's not even finished yet, mm. um, which is very very different from the way that things are being done in Hollywood right now. Mm. And um, yeah, and so and mm. then last year our character main character the anime girl was um, on the cover of Vogue mm. magazine, <laughs> mm. which also had um, was the first time that this happened. Mm. So. Um, it's just all a very giant experiment, mm. and you know, as, as we sort of push out this IP, we're um, using it as a sandbox to create um, the tools as well. So the people mm. who purchase the NFT not are not only 
you know, financially supporting the project, but they can then use those NFTs to um, vote on different creative decisions that go into making the project, which further um, perpetuates this relationship between the viewer and the creator mm. so that the viewers are not just passive, but mm. also more active and mm. feel more invested mm. in the IP itself. Um, and we believe in, obviously, things like provenance mm. of the blockchain, um, contributing to taste making, mm. uh, especially within film and entertainment. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, it, it's been very, very interesting. And I think, uh, um, especially in Japan, mm. uh, we have quite a few um, fans as well who respond well to it. So mm. um, yeah, we're very excited and I'm grateful for everybody here who supports the project. Awesome. So it was funding and marketing at the same time, and it helped uh, building some engagement with fans. Very nice story. Um, I think it's already got tons of learning for the Japanese industry. You know. Let's move on to Justin. Uh, would you introduce your project? Sure. So um, I started a company a few years ago called Playco, um, and we're remote, but we have a lot of key people in Japan. We spun out a Web3 company that I'm uh, quite focused on right now that has to do with IP. And so what we're trying to do is, is use NFTs as a way to help people who own IP, they have the rights to that IP, um, to go and create their own content with it. And so when we see trends like AI and the content becoming easier to create, and we see blockchain as a way to distribute and um, basically own a piece of the content and capture the upside, we think that these two things go very well together. So you can think of what we're building as um, a way. Right now, there are many projects with NFTs where if you own the character, you have the commercial rights to use that character. But you need capital, and you need resources, and it it's, takes time and work to make good content. So we sort of create the tools to make that easy. And then the people who own the IP can let other people create with it. Then when those people create with it and they get paid, um, everybody gets paid. So it's sort of taking like what happens in a game studio or a game company right now, and the coordination's happening through the technology instead of within one company. So you could have an IP holder who lives in Texas, they take their five characters, they give it to somebody else who goes and makes the game, and somebody else distributes it, and everybody's sort of getting paid. Um, it's, you know, there's a lot of challenges in that, but like hopefully the, the end user experience we're gonna be releasing in a few weeks is it ends up looking something sim simple enough that anybody in this room could use it. So I know it sounds complicated, but there's there's ways to use blockchain that are user facing, and there's ways to use it that are um, sort of to replace the way people coordinate. And so like when you think about a cap table in a company, investors think a lot about cap tables, but you don't think about fa Facebook's cap table when you use Facebook, right? So that's kind of our perspective on it, is like it's the technology that allows for the incentives to, to happen. So. Um, yeah, game engine for dis decentralized IP development. Thank you, Justin. So is it uh, already happening? I mean, um, are there many creators uh, yeah. actually creating? So so we opened up IP licensing to some of the biggest pro uh, projects in the space where they give IP to the holders. And uh, we've got over a 1,000 characters licensed into our platform now. So like technically speaking, we're the largest licensing platform. Now, we haven't done anything much of commercial value with them yet. So I think that's the phase I'm more excited about because ultimately no one's proven this thesis. For a few years now, people have been excited about the idea that you can distribute the ownership of all these different pieces of an IP in this way. But I don't think we've seen someone go and earn enough money with the pieces of it yet to say, wow, this really works. Um, but we look at games and it's a $100 billion industry and it's, I mean, we know how to make money with characters. So like, we feel like we can try to figure out the pieces that'll make that happen. Great, thank you. So, Oyu-san, Captain, please. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Captain. So, yeah, if I knew this panel was an otaku panel, <laughs> I should have worn my kind of like otaku otaku t-shirts today. <laughs> when I go for a business trip every time, kind of I brought my Hatsune Miku t-shirt. Hatsune Miku is a, like a, maybe everyone knows the like a blue pigtail hair, like a virtual character trash like a vocal music technology. So this is my like a fiance or something. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Yeah. Many otaku will get angry, so this is just kidding. But but I would say so yeah I'm a very otaku guy and also we are building Ismo right now and the B2 being communication platform and especially we do many experiments around like a technology plus otaku area. For example we are building 
AI plus VTuber character named as Iris. And as far as I know, that she's the first, very first character, AI power character, can speak Chinese, Japanese, English at the same time, very responsibly. So that we are building virtual character technology on the mobile device that everyone can have their own avatar start communicating to each other. So basically this is what we are working on right now. And so yes, this is, is more. Mm, nice. So uh, why did you think of making those virtual characters? Were you a big fan of Miku, Hatsune Miku, yes. and now you're a uh, real producer? <laughs> <laughs> and were you also a fan of uh, like Love Live, Uma Musume, and all those 2D characters? Oh, different, different. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I agree, right? Uh, I, yeah, I have a very big sense of like, uh, respect mm -hmm. yeah, for all those creations. Mm -hmm. And the, the one thing uh, we started is more, and we are very excited about those virtual slash manga anime technology. Uh, for example, B-tubing. Is it getting bigger and bigger? Maybe you guys already know. I also invested the any color, one of the biggest mm -hmm. B2B company on the earth. They listed a uh, couple of years ago, one year, one half year ago, and they hit a two billion USD variation within just four or five years. And we are very excited. Yeah, as a one of the minor, very, very minor energy investor, I saw the journey. Oh, this is the future. Everyone can fall in love in B2B kind of virtual existence mm -hmm. and even can pay money and even the future, even get married together, something like that. So I'm very fascinated by that technology. Mm. And OK, let's do that more internationally from day one. Mm. So this is the kind of reason why we came into that area again and working very hard every day and playing with virtual characters. <laughs> <laughs> Right. I mean, VTuber, virtual YouTuber phenomenon is fantastic uh, uh, race in Japan. Uh, I think it was like 2020. Uh, like most of the uh, uh, YouTuber in the uh, donation ranking in, in YouTube, uh, it was like dominated by Japanese VTuber. It was like 17 out of 20 was like Japanese VTubers. So, um, I mean, this is the country that... <laughs> yeah, actually, 2021, yeah. if I remember correctly, yeah. 8 out of 10, eight out top, of 10. top war, super chatted mm -hmm. like people mm -hmm. on YouTube were actually VTubers. Mm. So it's like competing against those PewDiePie and all those global YouTubers, right? So it's unbelievable. Okay, Sarah-san. Hello, uh, my name is Sarah. Um, when I was invited to do this talk and once someone was like, we're going to be an otaku talk, I was literally like, who doxed me? Because I was, I've been hiding my otaku side for like 10 years. I was like cosplaying every day in high school. I was like, you know, all-nighter anime girl. Um, I do something a little bit different now. I make virtual humans um, in Japan. Um, if you Instagram I-M-M-A Ima, um, that's kind of um, Asia's number one virtual human model. Um, for example, she does commercials for Porsche, Ikea, SK2. Um, she was chosen as wo Forbes Woman of the Year um, in 2020. Uh, she recently did a Harper's Bazaar cover um, in Taiwan as well. Uh, basically, she's like a real girl, but she's made out of CGI. Um, so it's basically an entertainment, kind of like an IP coming from Japan. Um, recently, um, we've also released a VTuber that's, you know, uh, we specialize in hyper-realistic virtual humans. Literally, if you follow her, like, look at her up on Instagram, people can't tell she's real. I meet a lot of people that are like, hey, where is Ima? Um, and I'm really like, she doesn't exist. And they're like, what? Um, and so we create that um, quality into VTubing. I think VTubing right now is a lot of anime characters, um, a lot of 2D characters, and that's already amazing in itself. Um, but we think we can upgrade that storytelling with using CGI that's very realistic, a lot more information, and looks like a human, but it can do many things. Like, for example, if you know she's angry, there's like maybe like fumes coming out of her head that a human can't do, right? So I think there's so much self-expression that can be created through virtual humans that we've never seen before. Amazing. So what made you produce that uh, idol? So you were also Taku, but you didn't go to those anime characters, but you uh, decided to right. make her a little bit, little bit uh, realistic. 
Right, design. right, right. I mean, I mean, it's it's a very hidden hobby of mine to be an otaku. <laughs> But kind of like how I ended up, it's like kind of a personal story because I come from a very art background. I went to art university. I thought I was going to be a painter when I came to Japan. Um, a lot of things happened, and I discovered virtual humans. Um, and I literally thought this was the newest form of art that existed on this earth because, you know, we create our lives on Instagram. And I follow people like, for example, Kylie Jenner that I've never met before, but I feel like I know her. I feel like, you know, she went to the pool today because she posted on her story. Maybe she didn't. Maybe it was like a video from a week ago. Who knows? But in that way, you can create reality. And I thought this newest form of art that I saw, which was Ima, was creating a life, which was, in my mind, I was like, this is greater than any art I've ever seen. So a per very personal reason why I'm into virtual humans, but I really think it can change the world. Mm. Nice. Creating a life, huh? Okay, thank you. So uh, let's uh, get into the next agenda, uh, how we can apply it to Japanese content, uh, starting from uh, Emily-san. So Emily-san uh, is engaged in Shibuya blockchain uh, project, and we heard a story from her that it's uh, funding and it's the, so blockchain helped funding and marketing, uh, getting engagement, and actually funding is like uh, one of the w one of the issue for Japanese industry. Uh, we have this anime seisaku uh, inkai committee. Uh, we used to have that kind of a committee, but then we had Demon Slayer, and what was amazing about Demon Akimetsu no Yaiba. <laughs> for the for the Japanese people, uh, what was great for Demon Slayer was their production fee uh, was uh, pretty much high, and and it was um, so it was possible because it was on funded by three companies and one of the company was a production, so uh, it was a little bit different uh, from the traditional Japanese way of funding that anime, so. Um, Japanese company, they're not really good at funding because, for, for instance, uh, uh, we, I would like Japanese content to compete with uh, Korean content. Eh? Uh, K-pop is doing a better job than Japan right now. And they have like uh, Webtoon, like manga. And Webtoon is, is uh, doing way better uh, in terms of making this uh, finance ecosystem. They have like um, they, they're funding uh, the productions, so but Japan they're not doing that. So uh, do you think uh, we can uh, do a better job uh, using those blockchain and uh, fund those uh, Japanese manga anime? So what do you think as an advantage of using uh, blockchain? Uh, is it uh, is it applicable to Jap Japanese anime manga? Yeah, absolutely. I think mm -hmm. um, it's applicable to mm -hmm. uh, most anything, mm -hmm. but it's um, most suitable for things that have a large following or fandom. Mm -hmm. And um, you know what was most revolutionary about uh, crypto and blockchain, mm -hmm. uh, specifically with the past two years, mm -hmm. is people are now you know understanding of things like DAOs forming mm -hmm. or um, so the power of sort of the the collective mm -hmm. of people, you know, pulling their money together um, in ways that wasn't really possible before mm -hmm. um, are now, you know, much easier because of um, the blockchain being efficient and also, you know, not having to bypass banks and, um, you know, fees um, that, that sort of the traditional financial mm -hmm. system requires. And so... I think that, w especially with an entertainment, when there's mm. such a large, you know, fan base of people who are mm. interested in this, and I, and I believe a hundred percent because anime is so big globally, mm. you know, not just in Japan, but and you know now I think um, it's it's getting e even more. I think anime is, you know, it's always been popular, but now it's making a comeback. Um, I think part of the reason is because uh, people like my age <laughs> or a little bit older people who maybe watched animes, especially the retro, you know, 80s style animes growing up are now at the age where they're starting to have children. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then so they want to introduce mm -hmm. what they like to their children. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why this type of anime is now now making a comeback. 
And so, you know, I think this is a really good timing and opportunity. Mm -hmm. You know, I was talking with the, um, one, one of the guys who, uh, at Crunchyroll who mm -hmm. explained that this phenomenon mm -hmm. is, is an upcoming thing as well, mm -hmm. where um, there's just this giant opportunity for Japan to capitalize on this um, massive culture uh, phenomenon that they've created. But um, with something like blockchain, then, you know, it doesn't require you mm -hmm. to... It, it, it's borderless, mm -hmm. right? So you can interact with fans internationally mm -hmm. without, you know, having to go through different currencies mm -hmm. or, or, or banking systems. Um, and I, I feel like that's definitely something that, mm -hmm. you know, if just as Justin said, I think the the blocker right now is that maybe on the more front end, um, mm -hmm. people don't know how to use blockchain. Mm -hmm. But then if yeah. people are, uh, you know, building things that are on the back end, then um, it would be much easier for the the user to do the same things that they were doing before, but just mm. with an improved technology that mm. makes things better, smoother, and more efficient. So it's always difficult to for me to explain to those people who have uh, IPs that, oh, blockchain help you funding. What would be the best place to start for those uh, established uh, people or senpai or oji-san, oba-san, or <laughs> for those who uh, don't uh, have a, a, a real uh, practical understanding. Uh, what would be the best best place to start for for the Japanese uh, traditional industry? Well, I think it, depending on how you you want to go about it, mm -hmm. if you want to just learn about blockchain in general, mm -hmm. there's a lot of good and uh, free resources um, on on the internet right mm -hmm. now now that sort of teach teach to you on this topic. Um, and then I think in terms of, you know, getting funding for your project, obviously that's something that Shubio wants to build and help, but mm -hmm. specifically for creators who want to make video content mm -hmm. or animated content. But um, right now there's a lot of platforms that already mm -hmm. uh, make this readily available. Mm -hmm. So, you know, anywhere from like the open mm -hmm. seas to foundations to um, mm -hmm. Zora, Manifold, uh, they create platforms where mm -hmm. as a creator you can go on mm -hmm. and, um, for example, sell um, you know NFTs or, or tokens, mm. and then you know then using. So it's pretty easy. You don't need to know how to code mm. or you know. Did you go to Shibuya, Prime Minister, Prime Minister of Sh uh, Shibuya, and explain? Actually, I did. So mm -hmm. uh, l last year yeah. in November, I did a a, pan a, mayor. a panel oh, mm -hmm. with with the mayor of mm -hmm. Shibuya, um, oh. but he's already very very knowledgeable oh. mm -hmm. in the area of oh. blockchain. <laughs> yeah, so I had the honor of of meeting him, mm. and we, we we had a discussion about blockchain together. Yeah. So maybe yeah, it's always helpful to find some leader that is uh, knowledgeable and get together and. In, yeah, influence. Yeah, it's mm. always about educating. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, Justin, son, so you are you are now trying to make this uh, ecosystem of uh, games generated by users. What well, what is the difficult point, and what do you think? Uh, uh, how you think it can be applicable to the, to the Japanese industry? Uh, yeah, I think there are there are many. Um, so uh, distribution is always at the heart of, of most of this stuff, I think, right? So I, I think one thing that blockchain has enabled is you can succeed at a smaller scale. And so we've seen projects that have fewer fans that can actually do something profitably. And so what I think a lot of people don't understand, because there's still a lot of use cases in blockchain that haven't really panned out, is that one use case, and I think Emily is like kind of hiding how famous of a blockchain artist she is. She's, she's like probably one of the most famous blockchain artists. Um, but this is not possible before. So like basically my last company was a, a game company where we really popularized the idea of virtual goods. And so 15 years ago, that was a new idea. It was happening in Japan and China and not really anywhere else. And we took it to the rest of the world. Um, and that enabled an internet native business model for games. So before that, there wasn't no such thing as games as a service. Um, and, and so you were selling things up front or you were making free web games that you couldn't make enough money to make them interesting. They were just hobbies, things people built on the weekend. And that's where art was on the internet, right? Basically, people could not sell their work online. And then this technology made it possible for people starting just a few years ago 
for the first time in 30 years of the internet to sell their work online. And that's something that like, no matter the value of any of the pieces, that's one of those genies that came out of the bottle that's never gonna go back. Um, and, I, and I think that that's just incredibly powerful. So like you saw 15 years of growth in games after that from an industry that was smaller than movies, it was smaller than music, and now it's massive, right? And I think you're gonna finally see art coming online. Who knows how big that'll be over the next 10 years. Um, and part of that is IP, right? And so if people can show and prove that they own these pieces of, of art or intellectual property online, um, then we think like people fall in love with the characters that are in games too, not just movies, not just the other pieces of content. And so what do we do with that, right? Um, how do we make it easy enough to create a game? Uh, Roblox and other platforms are working on things like that. For us, we think of it, there's gonna be a wide spectrum of games people make, I think, but we're very focused on like the type of UGC you would see on TikTok. So how do I make a game you can play in 30 seconds? So you can make one and I can make one and we can share it to each other. And you have to be able to play instantly. You, ha you can't have to download an app. It doesn't work, right? Like, would you get TikTok if the first time you wanted to watch a video you had to download the app? Probably not, right? So we're solving a lot of those problems. They're kind of like technology problems. They're not, um, but the, the end user experience is you get a game, you, you tap it, you play it, you win something. That person gets paid. All the people involved with the IP that was part of it get paid. Um, so it's, it, it really is f for us um, just figuring out how to make it so easy that someone, anyone who can use TikTok can use it. They don't need to know what the blockchain is. Do you expect Japanese uh, game creators to take part into your platform? Yeah, I mean, w one of the things that's interesting to me is like half of the world's biggest IP comes from Japan, right? So if you go look at like the top grossing IPs in the world, half of it comes from Japan. And um, it's interesting because like we hold all these, these narratives about Japan and most of these countries at the same time that are incompatible with each other. So one of the big ones I like is Japan is not a creative place. Japan has half of the world's largest IP has been created in Japan. But we all hold both those beliefs simultaneously, like how could that be, right? Um, Mario is one of the biggest movies of the year, yet Japan is not a creative place. So um, I, I think that Japan was a little bit slow to get in this sort of NFT space because um, a lot of it was done through discords. It wasn't exactly user friendly. It was in English and you had to like message a person who messaged another person who told you to go into this thing. And all that's kind of changing as it gets professionalized and localized and, and grows in different places. So um, I, I think people were trading on Japan's brand. Like mm -hmm. there's some really huge projects that are, um, that are really trading on Japan's brand. And I think that the larger companies that are now finally coming into the space, mm -hmm. I think they have a clear opportunity. There's so much demand for, for this, this type of content mm -hmm. globally. True. Yeah, we're more used to papers and pens yeah. than discords. <laughs> Things are changing. We're quitting using facts. So <laughs> now we're changing. So thank you, Justin. And Oyu-san, Captain. So your product is uh, really a Japanese type of product. Yeah? So how do you see the future? Uh, do you think it's possible? Do you think the future is going to be coming like uh, fans are like falling in love with characters or uh, what would the character, what kind of a role that character will play for, for the fans in the future? Oh, thank you very much for the question. So I would say, uh, first of all, kind of, yeah, we, our product and also character looks like kind of Japanese character. At the same time, kind of, we try not to say our target is, for example, international kind of people or US people yeah, some Japanese company try to bring their service. Let's like a go global. Can you show your product to the to the audience? Oh maybe? yes, yeah, it's <laughs> very small, yeah, yeah. screen. Though, if but the I'm gonna do it right there. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. So yeah. If so the camera is, can this is, zoom, this is our character. Hmm. Oh, yeah. We can zoom. We can see it. Yeah. Where On the screen. Here. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This is like a fun creation illustration. Hmm. Let me just show it again. Yeah. So they are streaming. This is a character. This yeah. is like a character. Mm -hmm. This character name is Iris. It's mm -hmm. doing streaming on YouTube. Yeah. So this is a fun creation mm -hmm. that one of the fans created this character and the illustration and posted on Twitter X. And, and users uh, are live streaming. Uh, mm -hmm. This is uh, like a, we made this character. Oh, and this character, character is streaming mm -hmm. powered by AI mm -hmm. right now. Especially not the illustration side, more about like a brain side. They can talk like character and like a 
automated, like a power by oh, I can talk in multiple languages. And so, <laughs> so let's get back to your question. So I just say kind of we are our target is more about like a, like a people who watch who enjoy anime in English. So all over the world. So the the, the question is the one of the most important stuff is that we see that there are so many people are enjoy like a, that otaku anime content all over the world, and we believe that, that as you mentioned the webtoon trend, and uh, I think it's very important to go back to the stats, and uh, we saw some webtoon company IPO last, two years ago last year in Korea, but the size is not that big. And uh, on the other hand, Japanese IP publishing company is getting bigger in revenue-wise year by year, recently. And uh, we see that the, I think the character itself is very important, the IP is very strong, and as Justin mentioned, the Japan is very good at creating IP, and the thing is, so we see that the we are very good at creating character in Japan, and also good at in good meaning, a bad way, good, good way and bad way, good at creating small something good. For example, Evangelion, new West movie, spent around thirty to forty million for production and made one hundred million. So kind of good at making small, good, like very nice. So it's not like Marvel, Hollywood. It's yeah, Marvel is much, size, much bigger, eh? right? yeah. different like award. But right? more enthu enthusiastic, enthusiastic. Yes. Right? But IP itself is so strong. So many people I enjoy Evangelion, like a video and even like a figure as well. So I just say that character itself ha can have a very strong like IP power. So that is a potential opportunity for Japanese company. And I would not say the answer, I would say that AI, Web3 can be an answer immediately right now. But the important stuff is kind of how we could do a monetization in the middle of production. The anime is right now the preparing for a couple of years and make, uh, and finally, the, they, they published on the TV show, Netflix, and uh, the monetization opportunities are a little bit limited. So that we definitely need to think on how we could monetize even the in middle of production. So I would say this is one of the things we need to think. And so that maybe we can integrate new technology, but I don't say AI the answer, Web3 the, will be the answer. I try not to think like that. But Pokemon have like uh, 4 trillion yen per year. So I think monetizing IP is uh, depends on how uh, enthusiastic the fan is and how uh, many of the, how many fans are there so volume of the fans so i think the first step will be developing a uh, strong ip so do you think uh, those virtual idols will replace real ones like johnny's uh Johnny's idols and all those uh, uh, real human, would they replace th them or is it like totally different? Uh, I would say it's very important to like, separate. Like, anime and game is also very different. So I would say kind of, Pokemon is very good at making contents like, occasionally. So game is, for example, Genshin. So I talk with some like, otaku guy from all over the world and uh, Genshin is one of the super, super biggest IPs in these days because they can continuously update contents, but anime is not like that. So I would say kind of like, a, I don't say the B-tubing, for example, will take over the Pokemon or something like that, but maybe they can like merge the how they can teach each other. For example, for B, from B-tubing side, B-tubing are very good at updating contents everyday basis. So it's much easier for like a company to create IP like a quicker than traditional IP because they have many touch points. So this is a one of the important points. At the same time, the VTubing itself is more very, very high passion, high kind of high calorie contents. Every day we can talk. At the same time, if we can talk every day, and it's easy for people spending much energy, even money. And after like watching everyday streaming, kind of, for example, four months, we feel, oh, we are tired. 
So that it's very important to maintain or control how we make user spend energy and like a, in other words, like a carry for the contents. So we are thinking how we could merge traditional IP area and also more real time IP area, YouTube in, in other words. Maybe we need portfolio. Yeah. <laughs> Part oh, of the monetize so. will be uh, super chat. Part will be like good selling. Right. Very quick. The, the importance, most important, like my message is many yeah. people are confusing. Oh, B tubing will be Pokemon or IP. Or they're mixed up all together, like a B tubing, kind of like a B tubing, like a, I would say more indie B tubing is more like a communication platform, long tail mm -hmm. communication platform. And a very big VTuber is like a half IP and a half communication. Half communication. But anime mm. is more about like a contents mm. side. Mm. So we need to think like these three, mm. actually more though, mm. are different. So value proposition is like different. It's different, yeah. yeah. User mm. experience is also different. Mm. So we really need to separate those mm. three into separate categories. Mm -hmm. Got it. Thank you. So Sarah San, uh, I'm sorry that you were hiding, uh, but uh, <laughs> I'm billed as otaku. Né? Uh, so uh, how do you see Japanese content? Uh, how do you see the situation right now? And do you, if you have any advice to Japanese industry, please, can, can we be better? <laughs> I think. I go overseas a lot, and I think uh, one of my main jobs is to bring Japanese IP into the outside world, um, including our virtual humans. Our virtual humans were always made in Japan, but it's our target audience is not Japanese people. It's really overseas people that love Japanese culture. And I meet so many you know, celebrities and people outside of Japan, and they all love Japan. It's crazy. And Japanese people don't really understand this. Everyone I've spoken to in the last like six months is like, I want to move to Japan. <laughs> I watch anime every day. And I think anime is becoming more of a culture um, rather than hidden in like, I guess, the otaku subculture. You know, like Billie Eilish, Justin Bieber wearing, you know, anime shirts at concerts. And I think that's like crazy. You know, it's going into like, I was shamed for being an otaku in high school, but now it's like, it's a cool thing. So I think, um, and so there is that kind of um, wave. Uh, around the world where everyone wants to make anime music videos. Everyone, I guess so many like messages from everybody is like, how can I find a Japanese anime studio? And they're booked for like two years, right? So like Emily's project, I think it's super interesting because it, like, it's creating different groups and like subgroups to kind of like um, make a different organization compared to what we have right now as you know, very traditional, as you said, anime committee where, you know, you have to book them two years in advance, um, blah, blah, blah. And, but one of the key things is that you need a middle person. You need like a bridge um, because I think Japanese industry is so closed, which I think is a beautiful thing because only in that environment, these crazy ideas and these crazy creations come from. And I really think Japan's a super unique country. And I think that's the reason why we have such great IP is that I think we have little influence from the outside, so these like imaginations go crazy. Um, but I think there's a, there needs to be a middle person. I think a lot of people I met that does that is like you know they've grown up in Japan um, and they've also grown up in the states or somewhere else, but they come back to Japan because they love Japanese IP. They want to spread it. These can be music producers, um, me like a virtual human producer, anime producers. I think there needs to be more middle people. Um, and I try to be that bridge because I do understand bo both worlds. And I think for people who wants to go into Japan that doesn't know Japanese culture, it's kind of hard to go into it because like, why are these committees? Like, why is no one talking to you? Why can't I talk to the manga artists and start collaboration? It's like, there's so many walls to get to there. Um, so I think, yeah, I think a bridge, I think more producers are needed rather than creators, mm. yeah. Great, thank you. More producers needed. So, uh, do you have any experience uh, that you open the door of the that closed uh, community in Japan? Is it wasn't it hard uh, to make them move? How do you like uh, talk to those uh, people? For sure, I think um, that's also one of the reasons why we do virtual human that look like a human because. Um, you know, when people see VTubers, you know, it's a very closed otaku community, which is huge, 
but normal people in the States will be like, what is that? You know, even though it's such, like, if you touch it, it's like an amazing, fun thing, but they just think like it's that subculture of those 2D characters in Asia, which is very, very, um, it's regretful. But when, you know, when I do this virtual human thing, it looks very real. I mean, it looks like a real human. So she, you know, people who see her are very, um, they don't have this wall against her. They're like, oh, what is this, you know? Um, and then they slowly get into, because of one of, you know, a virtual human's culture is that she's, she really loves anime, she really loves Japanese culture. So I think that opening is definitely needed. Um, and because, yeah, I mean, like, Pokemon is very easy to understand because it's not this, it's this, like, monster thing that people understand. I think, yeah, I think, like, that's why real-life-looking uh, virtual humans can be very cool to integrate. Um, and I do get to talk to a lot of different variety of people because of it, not just one uh, category. So, yeah. Mm. Cool. There's a Japanese idiom called Hyakubun uh, Aiken Nishikazu. And so they never understand until they see it. So it's always good to have some works uh, done by yourself and not just uh, explaining by your words, but if you have some works uh, with you, uh, it'll be easier for Japanese old school uh, industrial person uh, to understand what they should do. Okay, great. So uh, I'm going to be opening up this panel to the floor. So if you have any questions, uh, please. So I would take uh, three in advance to uh, Yes, I have two questions, actually. The first one is to Emily and Justin. You know, this year we experiencing the downside of NFT market. How is it affecting your business right now? And the second question is to Captain and Sarah. Um, you know, like, in South Korea right now, and also in China, there's an increasing, you know, virtual idols also. Um, how do you think your characters, the, the advantage of your characters compared to your competitors? Thank you. So, uh, degrees of NFT market and virtual idols, and your camera on something, please. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, so, maybe more to Justin on this one as well. As a like, so I'm a noob when it comes to this sort of thing, the Web3 and all that sort of stuff. How do you bridge that gap? And uh, it's also, Emily, is educating me on the safety of this, the security aspects of it. You know, like, can somebody hijack my NFT and take off of it and you impersonate me or something like that? Do you, have you considered these aspects? I'd like to hear about it. Thank you. Okay, security. And maybe one more person. Okay, we'll wait. Uh, so, uh, first one, uh, a decline of NFT market. Uh, well, I would be lying if I said that the decline of the NFT market did not affect our business. Of course, it affects every business that's in the industry. I will say that, uh, you know, with, when the bull market was happening and all of the profile picture projects were going crazy, <laughs> I... I I think I already kind of foresaw this happening as a not um, scalable or super sustainable. And so um, when we released Shibuya, we made it, uh, tried to make it very clear in the communications that this is not a profile picture project and this is not a project where you buy it and you're expecting you know, a return of profit. Um, we really, really shifted the focus from the very beginning on the IP that we are creating, um, which is the, uh, at the time, was just the White Rabbit um, animations. And so um, I think now we've been quite lucky that um, most of the people who have been following in the beginning were clearly understanding this because we, you know, said it again and again in our communications, whether it's on social media or, you know, in the blog posts and fundraising announcements. So... Um, I think, you know, con continuously, maybe right now, for example, it would be really hard for me to, in this market to go to an independent creator and say, yes, I believe you can raise a million dollars for your animation project 
by selling NFTs. Right now in this market, I think it's going to be very, very difficult. And so I, uh, but I think it's, it's a good time basically to have us readjust, you know, what does it mean? You know, what, because I feel like with the market before, people were sort of getting the capital up front and then not really delivering on their promises um, of creating, you know, whether it's an animation or a game or, you know, whatever it is that they're promising. And then so now I think, you know, the market is sort of pushing people to uh, reverse that kind of order. So you have to build something of value or something that people actually like first. It needs to be tested. And then I think, you know, then it would come after. So um, I, I think it's a good thing. I think it's a healthy readjustment. But for sure, it, it, it will be more difficult for um, smaller creators right now to get the kind of capital injection that they would have gotten a year ago. Yeah, Justin, I, I wouldn't have to add much more to that because I think it was a great answer. But I, I'll just say, um, Oyu-san also said earlier, like I think something to the effect of, I'm going to misquote you, but um, you're not looking at Web3 to solve the problem. You're just trying to solve the problem and create the value. And then if Web3 does it, great. Um, I think I have a similar perspective. And I think if you look at the, the history, uh, and, and my background, 15 years ago, there was no such thing as Web3. I'm not. Um, in many ways, when I go to the Web3 conferences, it took a couple years for people to even accept me as one of them. Um, I, I may be young in some crowds, but I'm a boomer when it comes to Web3 people. So I, um, I think the reason for it is what it enables, right? And so if you look at a lot of these IPs, we talked about Pokemon. Pokemon didn't start because they were cute. Actually, Nintendo did something very, very clever that got every single kid in my elementary school to buy Pokemon. And it was that they released two games, and they did not have the same Pokemon, and then they used the trading cable from one Game Boy to another, and that was the first time we'd ever seen that in a video game. Uh, and if you go back through the history of every video game, like there's always some really specific technological innovation that drove an IP to a new level. And then we go back and we forget. No one's thinking about the trading cable anymore, but that's what made Pokemon Pokemon. And so I'm in the business of startups, right? So. I like once you're a big company, like my advice is like the risk on this stuff is, is different. And so it's hard to execute on. But when you're a small company and you're trying to figure out how to become Pokemon, you got to go figure out what the trading cable is. Um, and, and so NFTs is one place right now, I think, where like there might be some of that opportunity. Um, and there are very, very few. There are so many companies competing in so many ways. And I think it's one of the most interesting places where you can actually do some fundamentally new things. You can distribute the ownership. You can have fans like, I mean, you should see the fans on, on Izumo's project. They, like, you showed the fan art on his phone. This is not the approach of, of older IP companies, right? They think they need to protect their IP. Web3 IP is like something that people say, no, the community owns it together, either literally or sometimes like in spirit. And the company has the opposite approach. The only way we can beat the big companies is by making it grow this way, right? And so um, that has nothing to do with the value of of any of the NFTs in the market. It's, it's a new way for us to distribute the ownership and the up, upside and um, you know, the, the power, to, frankly, to more people. So that's why, that's why I'm excited about it. Um, when it comes to teaching people about like, the security and everything like that, I just think the, the space is a, is a little bit like the punk rock scene or something in the 90s. There's just like a bunch of people, they're too cool for school, and they don't want other people to come in. You know, and there's like a mosh pit happening, and they're like, if you're scared of it, like just go home. Um, and I and I think that's one of the the toughest parts about the space, is like pleasing those punk rock people, and then also like slowly like bringing in you two in the back door, um, without getting kicked out. That's very very difficult. And and I think that's one of the things the space has been really good at. Is it just it kicks out like all the different commercial entries? Did you know Hello Kitty released an NFT project? Probably almost no one in this room. Uh, knows that, and I, I mean, I, I know if, if one of you worked on it, I'm sorry, but like it didn't, it didn't do very well. And but there's many such examples. There's Game of Thrones. All of the big Hollywood IPs tried to come in last year, and they all failed. And it's because there's a set of ideals that the people that are in the space demand, and the companies weren't meeting the ideals. Um, and and I think what pe makes people excited about the technology is that it enables those ideals. But if you come in and you don't, you don't also do those things, and people, they, they're not interested, um, the people that are in the space right now. So education comes from, you shouldn't have to do it, right? Someone has to build 
products that you don't need to learn to use. Um, but the risk is real. I mean, like Mark Cuban got hacked a few weeks ago. He's one of the earliest investors in a bunch of these different companies, so he's very sophisticated. Fred Wilson got hacked a week ago. He's like the first investor in CryptoKitties and Dapper. So I'd be lying if I said there's a state you get to where you even know what you're like. You're immune to that. So until we actually build products that are easy enough where people aren't randomly going around connecting their wallet to everything, then it's just going to continue to happen. Um, but I think we're there's a lot of progress happening on this. So I'll just add that um, you know at the end of the day, having a hardware wallet is still at least right now the safest way to keep your assets. You know, and most of the time when people, even the sophisticated people or who are native in the industry, are getting hacked, it's usually from from a hot a hot wallet, which is um, one that is not on stored on, on a hardware wallet. The point of a hardware wallet is that when you're when you need to send funds out, you have to physically click some buttons that confirm that you're sending. But you know, with a hot wallet, um, you don't need to do that. Um, and so, just just a pro tip for everybody, you know, that you should, if you really want to keep your assets safe, you should probably get a hardware wallet. <laughs> It's like in Japan when you have to use a fax machine to order something, right? You have to. We're really good at that. No. Okay, then no use, uh, son, yes. Captain. Uh, the competitors in China, how you compete? Oh uh, yes. So my answer will be very simple, actually, because we are building a communication like a platform type of application. For now, we will reveal the more information coming three to four five months, though. Like, no, we are not competing. We are not like IP. We d don't define ourselves as like IP creation company. We are more about like a platform company and supporting like many like B indie VTubers and like even bigger type of middle size of VTubers as well. Basically, we are building a tool for VTubers can like uh, sometimes monetize and can like uh, like we try to support their activities. So as a like a platform company. So basically, we will not compete, even kind of we will work together with them. So basically our approach is a little bit different. So the, my answer will be very simple and we are not competing with those people and we are very happy for them to, and you know, for many countries can have their own b 2 culture. And my investor for example, any color, doing a very good job, working with Biri Biri and making some revenue, even from a Chinese area. So the other company cannot do very well because they're a big kind of informational war sometimes. So but they're doing a very good job. So we see that the like, collaboration approach is more suitable for our company, is more. So yeah, this is my answer, yeah. Sarasan? There's um, so many virtual humans coming out in the world, especially from China and in Korea too. I was talking to one of our Chinese partners and he was like, there's like 100 virtual humans coming out in China every single day. I'm like, how is that possible? Um, but I think all in all in all, we're not, in our side, we're not focusing on the technology of virtual humans. We're talking about storytelling uh, when we are creating virtual humans. You know, um, we are on the news a lot for like, you know, this virtual human is so realistic. But at the end of the day, you follow someone, you become a fan of someone, not because they're human, not because they're CGI. You like the things they say, you believe in the things that they believe in. Um, and that's how you become a fan of something. Um, and that's why we're focusing on storytelling way more than technology. Technology allows us to tell that story, but in the end, you know, there's, everyone's gonna be a virtual human in like two or three years. Um, and our virtual humans are just gonna be one of those. Um, and we're gonna live on with more of a storytelling uh, technique because you know, people are gonna be a fan of our virtual humans, not because they are virtual human, because they believe in what you know, uh, we also believe in. So yeah. Uh, focusing on storytelling more than technology, and that's why we're doing live streaming recently. You know, we can't just we can't really tell a story through pictures and like post production videos of like TikTok dances. Um, when we when people watch live streams, like hours and hours of you know people hearing someone talk, um, that's a lot of storytelling. Um, it's more than I think what you see. You know, celebrities interviews on TV. Um, so I think live streaming is going to be the next big mainstream media uh, for people to connect to each other. Very nice. So storytelling more than technology. So technology is just a tool, and just as Captain Uisan said, uh, uh, communication more than the way it looks. So technology always uh, drives the real value inside it. It virtualizes the real value. 
So more and more inside is more important. So that's why they can compete uh, probably against uh, Korean or Chinese uh, IPs. All right, so uh, uh, at the end, uh, let's get uh, one minute <laughs> uh, brief comment from each of the panelists uh, to uh, maybe can we get a one final advice to Japanese industry, <laughs> how we can compete. Emily uh, Well, uh, you know, I, I'm probably biased like everyone else on this panel because we're all otakus of some sort. I'm probably last place in that regard. <laughs> but I, I would say that on the cu culture creation front, Japan is doing great, has always been, and will always be a leader in um, IP creation. And um, so now, you know, I, I, I see a lot, of obviously, from like the from the Shibuya government and also just, I think, across Japan, this increasing interest in wanting to learn about this technology is uh, very, very important. And um, so, you know, personally, I feel that as, as soon as that keeps happening and people are just educating themselves and being, you know, cognizant of, of, of um, what's going on, um, we you will catch up. And uh, I would say, you know, the United States is probably going in the opposite direction right now. <laughs> so uh, it, it's a great time. I think it's an exciting time, especially for Asia uh, to exist within this industry. By the way, everybody should see Emily's uh, Shibuya project. It's really cool. Oh, thank you. You yeah. can watch it on our website. <laughs> yeah, Justin. Yeah, no, the anime is incredible. Um, and I think you did you draw like almost everything in the first part with like one other person or something. Uh, yes. So before we had any money, oh, two two people made the animation, um, yeah. and then as we got more funding, then we hired more people. It's crazy. You should watch it. It's like. Um, you're not gonna take this compliment, but it's like Ghibli level animation with two people for the first few minutes. It's really unbelievable. Um, so uh, look, I, I think what, uh, Japan is already one of the best countries in the world at creating IP. So I, I don't think um, I have much advice to give there. I think that that's what I was trying to have everybody remember before, which is like half the top IP in the world already comes from Japan. Um, I think what's happening now is how you distribute IP. And I think that's changing so rapidly that it's it's just hard to even keep on top of it. And I think one thing that we learned with Web3 was like, if, if you don't trade the Japanese IP outside, well then, Azuki comes. And Azuki is like the California role of, of Japanese IP. It's, it's all, all the people in Web3 corralled around this, really, the art is great, this, this brand um, that's made by a bunch of Americans who love Japanese anime. Um, and that's what happens if, if you don't bring it there first. But I think the same thing is about to happen in AI, where I don't think you get to choose how people use your characters. And fan art is something that, that people have been making who are talented in drawing, but now fan art is something that everybody's gonna make. And I have a friend who started this esports company a few, uh, seven or eight years ago, and it became the biggest esports company in the world for organizing tournaments for Smash Brothers. And I took him to Japan like six or seven years ago, and it turned out every time somebody tried to have a Smash Brothers tournament in Japan, Nintendo would send them a notice and say, don't do that. They said, we don't want you to put the characters in there. Why are you doing that? Stop it. They, they took all these fans that were so passionate, they wanted to sell tickets, all the best players of all their games, and they told them, don't do that. And now they've come around on this in a couple of years, but it was sort of six years after everybody else. Um, and like, I just don't, I think that that's the lesson. Like, This is about to happen on the content creation side. All these fans who've never been able to create things, not just games, not just, they're, they're all gonna be making tons of content over the next few years. And I think you have to find a way to support it. And it's totally against the um, intuitions, I think, that these companies have had. So it's going to be challenging. But I think it's really important. So we're running out of time, so really quick. <laughs> uh, yes. So my answer is also very simple. Let's think about not like competition, more about collaboration, I would say. So that basically kind of like a VTubing as well, kind of recent, like uprising kind of contents all about like a collaboration. So the user can even support making content for them YouTube and streaming. They do a clips for helping characters. So basically, like a Pokemon as well, like a trading is a type of collaboration, user to user collaboration. Sometimes also IP also can do open for more about collaboration from company side to user side as well. 
So I would say, kind of, this is not the advice. Kind of, we also working so hard how to make it like realize. Kind of, the collaboration is more important for, kind of, in these days, uh, new types of IP. So I would say, always try to think about how to collaborate with users and other contents as well. So I think this is the most important one of the concepts. Okay, Sarasan. Two words. Two words. <laughs> Um, no, I think it, it, it all goes back to human connection. I think we all want to connect with each other. We all want to self-express and then be accepted. I think that's all the basis of why people love anime, why people love virtual humans, why people love streaming. We just want to connect with each other. And I think you know, um, Japanese contents can do so much better in that aspect. I mean, like Pokemon should say yes to all of those things to you know, support that because it's not just an AP. It's a way of people connecting with each other as human beings. And that's kind of our need as a human species. So. Mm. Yeah, I think we can all look back to that and create stuff that you know can make all of us more happy. Thank you. So uh, great. Uh, uh, please uh, give a big hand to the panelists, <laughs> and we'll get back in within a year, and we'll see how Japanese content uh, have done <laughs> within a year. Thank you.